Metal Mike came to us with the idea of Kiss Motley Crue. And at first it just sounded too big to be possible. So I think for a while we kind of shelved it with the idea that it's not even possible. But it is possible. Kiss versus Motley Crue. What do you say, hair metal guru? When you're talking about two bands that, that have, have had careers that have intertwined, uh, you made the suggestion, and I'm like, oh, you are exactly right. Kiss and Motley Crue. They kind of go together like peanut butter and jelly. So I'm I'm pumped to to discuss this. How their careers just kind of seem to take take this the the same path. Yeah, in a lot of ways, I look at it. It's like the master versus the student. You know what I mean? Because like Motley took a lot from Kiss. Kiss took a lot from people before them too. You know what I mean? So everybody's borrowing from everybody. It's pretty common in metal. But you know, even though they started in different decades, like you said. A lot of similarities, and there's some times where it's not similar, and we'll go over that too. But before we jump in, man, your channel's doing great. Tell everybody about your channel real quick and where they can catch it. Oh, hey, well, thank you, thank you. It's it's at Hair Metal Guru. I've uh, been going for about for about eleven months, and and like I told almost everybody, you know, the '80s glam metal cast is is what I look to for inspiration, you know, with your channel. So, and you've been great about coming on and, and helping me out with stuff. So, yeah, at, at Hair Metal Guru. Also, you can check me out on X at Hair Metal Guru. Well, thanks, man. That's some kind words. I like it. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right. So, what I'm thinking what we'll do here is we'll kind of do an album battle. We'll kind of go through their beginnings to maybe their last, you know, studio albums that they did together. Maybe we'll even pit the individual members against each other toward the end, <laughs> yeah. uh, which, which will be very interesting. But uh, let's jump in, man. Yes. Right from the beginning. Kiss debut versus Too Fast for Love. So you figure they're both coming out pretty early in their respective decade. Uh, they're both pretty different than the norm of what's going on, especially Kiss. You know what I mean? Kiss is really, you know, we're just coming out of like the hippie thing and all that. And now you got Kiss, which is, you know, black leather and face paint and all this kind of stuff. Motley Crue, too, also coming out of the punk thing, the new wave thing. So kind of bringing metal back in. What are your thoughts on these two? And, and uh, eventually what we'll do is we'll, you can... Give me your pick, and I got a piece of paper and a sharpie, and I'll, I'll write it all down, man. We'll tally it up. Sure. Well, I mean, you, you said it ex exactly right. They, they were both starting off the decade with something completely different, and and not just. I mean, obviously with the look, but the sound. I mean, Kiss. You know, I mean, we had heavy metal. You know, we had Black Sabbath, but Kiss took this took this new new form of music, amped it up, sped it up. You know, put in a ton of attitude. And to start off the 70s, I mean, this came out in 74, and then you get Motley Crue, you know, like the music scene's kind of dying in the late 70s, early 80s. We need like a kick in the ass, and here comes Motley Crue, you know, lighting themselves on fire at the Troubadour, you know, <laughs> this outrageous look, outrageous sound. So I, I think, you know, both of those first albums are just, you know, the shot the shot in, in the rear end that, that music needed to set them off for a new decade. You know what's funny, though, I give both these albums is the sound is good, but it's not there yet. You know what I mean? I guess this is common for a debut, unless you're like Guns N' Roses and you, you came out of the gate with like your biggest yeah. album. You know, Kiss, like for me, the Kiss album is like, it's a little slow. You know what I mean? Like it's oh. not very distorted. I think Kiss he says it themselves. You know, once you get to a live, that's, that's kind of how these songs are supposed to be played. Motley is a different sound, too. You know, Vince is... He's really whiny here, but I, I like it. But you know what I mean? It's, I don't think his voice is fully developed yet. And the sound of music that they're doing is almost kind of like a hybrid thing, which I think is really cool. But they really kind of went toward uh, the hair model thing as the 80s progressed. But I, they're, neither of them really have come into their own yet. No, and, and you're right. Both of those first two albums really did suffer from production. Yep. And I kind of like the, you know, the, the Motley Crue raw production on Too Fast for Love. But, but the Kiss debut, I mean, shoot, half of that album was still playing in the Kiss set list at the end, at the end of their career. Yeah, but when yeah. you listen to it, it you know, you're like, man, if anything was begging for a remastering was, was that first Kiss. Or, Shoot the first kit for three. The first three Kiss albums 
really sound like like I you know the songs are good, but you, but you're right, the production wasn't quite there yet until they hit the Alive album. And you made a great point because when you think of the heavy hitters, like you said, you got Deuce, Strutter, Cold Gin, Black Diamond, Firehouse. You oh. know, Motley's like Live Wire is a song that's kind of stood the test of time. Other songs kind of get you know thrown in occasionally like on with the show or too fast for love or something like that but for the most yeah. part those kiss songs are like standards yes and and you know and i, I always kind of wondered because i thought a lot of that first two of the too fast for love album was phenomenal i mean mm-hmm. and i've i've been been pretty upfront about saying that the first two motley crew albums are probably probably my two favorite albums and and you're right when you look at a motley crew concert now you don't you, you get live wire for sure, but after that, you know it's it's kind of ignored, and which really surprises me. Well, man, it's come down to the wire. It's come down to the live wire. What are you uh, gonna, What are you going to pick, man? You going to go for too fast? You going to go for the Kiss debut? Oh, you, you, you're really killing this. This may be my hardest choice. Um, I love Too Fast for Love, but I think. I think when I when you look at the import at, at music as a whole, and especially for for P, two P, two guys like us who just love '80s rock, every band in the '80s was inspired by Kiss, and I think that first album just still, even though it's pr- production wise isn't that great, it's still just you know so many epic songs that you know you can just go right down the list. Still played in concert, so very narrowly. I'm going to go with the Kiss debut album. Uh, I mean, I understand where you're coming from, but I'm going to disagree. I'm going to go with Too Fast, man, because I just I love that album. I think it's so unique and so different. It's, it's an anomaly in their catalog. And I, I kind of dig that the songs haven't been trampled on a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Something like Starry Eyes, that's not burnout out for me. You know what I mean? Where like Cold Gin <laughs> and, and some of those yeah. songs, I'm sat with Cold Gin. I, it's great, but I'm sat. You know, you got Starry Eyes, you've got... PC or action, uh, merry go round and round. I don't know, man. I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with the debut for Motley. And and part of the reason that I I think two of my favorite Kiss songs, shoot, three of my favorite Kiss songs, nothing to lose. Mm. Shoot, four of my favorite Kiss songs, Strutter, yep. Cold Gin, and Black Diamond. You know, so a huge part of my favorite part of Kissery is that debut album, but. You know, and I knew you'd be an asshole and have to disagree with, <laughs> with me right away. Like if I had said Motley, you would have said Kiss. Yeah, you know, because you know just you, trying you're trying to you. drive up the ratings. So <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I, I, I'm tomorrow I could have picked Motley Crew, but today yeah. I'm going Kiss. All right, man. Well, when you get to the next offering by each band, it's almost like <laughs> they each get a little demonic. Oh, For their second right. second album, you know, shout at the devil, hotter than hell. I think the reverse of the first Kiss album uh, for Hotter Than Hell is you've got a ton of great deep tracks that that you don't hear a lot. You know what I mean? Coming home, strange ways, mainline, all the way. There's a lot of cool shit that doesn't get a lot of attention on Hotter Than Hell. Oh, and and shoot, my, I I love the song "Let Me Go Rock and Roll." Mm-hmm. Uh, that's always been one of my favorites. And and what what I think is kind of is you got hotter than hell, you have shout at the devil. So I think these are the albums where where people started to go, oh, both of these bands are kind of demonic, you know, like 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 churches were starting. You know, I mean, I think that with a hotter and the hotter than hell album, that's where people started to. We got a boycott. Kiss, Kiss stands for Knights and Satan Service. Shout at the devil. You know, a lot of people were thinking. We're thinking, hey, maybe Motley Crue's shouting with the devil. I know right. Nikki Six said, hey, we're not shouting with the devil. We're shouting at the devil. But both of those bands kind of have that that point in their history where people were starting to wonder if uh, if the demonic thing was going a little deeper than than we thought. Yeah, and I think they played into it because if you ever listen oh. to the commercial for um, Hotter Than Hell, they, they say the demons of rock is that they, they, they yes. say in the commercial. And even when you look at the cover. 
I know it's got like the Japanese writing, but it's it's pretty messed up looking. It's it's just kind of you know it, it kind of it's thought provoking. You know what I mean? The picture's kind of dark, and then there's all the Japanese stuff, and then the back cover looks like there's some kind of you know orgies or I don't know what the hell's going on in the back. <laughs> and then look at Motley Crue, you know, where, where they're in their like hellish state with all the fire and the spikes and all that kind of stuff. So so definitely right. both kind of playing into that whole scene and that whole image. Right, and and this is. I mean, well, Motley, Motley exploded on Shout at the Devil. Yeah. Kiss still had to wait their turn because they, they had to wait for the for Alive, which was coming up. But I think, you know, th- these two albums were the beginning of, of, the, of Kiss and Motley Crue being a huge part of the rock and roll conscious in their respective decades. When you look at production, I mean, the, most people will agree the production on Hotter Than Hell blows, right? It, oh, shit. It sucks it's really bad. And it's too bad because, like I said, there's some really, really great songs. Shout Out to Devil's got great production, and it's got super strong songs that they've played, um, you know, they keep, they play to this day, you know what I mean? So, for me, I know I gotta go Motley again. I'm shocked because Kiss is my favorite band, but I'm, I'm putting another one for Motley. Right. Now, th- this one, it, it is, it's not even close. No. It's Motley Crue. <laughs> and, and Shout Out to Devil would be, you know, and, and like, like I said, Too Fast for Love, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I can bury between Too Fast being my favorite album and Shout at the Devil being yep. my favorite album. But in this battle, there's, man, Shout is, is just, it was everything, Shout at the Devil was everything a teenage kid was looking for in the early 80s from a band, you know, as you know, you're trying to find your identity and here's this band that's like, come along with us, man. I mean, nothing's going to hold us back. So yep. it's it's epic, it's eponymous, and, uh, and easily wins that debate. And it's funny, you kind of, alluded to this a little bit but motley kind of found their success and their sound on this album and like you said kiss is is almost there kiss is out, like two albums away you know they just got to get to a live and then they're going to explode and then then they're going to have a run that probably is bigger than most bands have ever had so oh abs, abs, absolutely and and motley crew motley crew knocked down the door and and kiss is walking up to it right now All right, so Destroyer versus Theater of Pain. There's probably people laughing, right? All those the haters of Theater of Pain are all laughing right now. They're like, "There's no chance." <laughs> but look at the similarities, right? You've got a refined image. The image definitely changed. Kiss, Kiss looked kind of nastier, right, when they first came out. But now there's money involved. So like, yeah, they oh, still yeah. look, you know, like demons of rock, but they're, it's a little bit more refined than it ever was. And Motley Crue, I mean, took it to a whole different level. I mean, come on. They're wearing pink and polka dots and all this crazy shit. And what's funny, and and people can agree or disagree, a big ballad really saved both of these albums and made these albums huge. Without Home Sweet Home, I think all will agree that Theater of Pain would have been a flop. And Beth really saved um, Destroyer. I mean, Destroyer would have been fairly big, but I think Beth just pushed it over the uh, up into the stratosphere. You're absolutely right, and that was going to be the point that I made. You know, and and as far as ballads go, you are getting you know huge. I mean, I I'm not an expert on the '70s, but you know, Beth or Beth has to be one of the first huge ballads. I know you know Nazareth had Love Hurts, yep. but you know, suddenly here comes this song that probably turns Destroyer from a platinum album to a triple platinum yep. album. Yep. You know, and then when with Molly Crew and hair metal, I mean, most of the early metal bands or hair metal bands weren't doing ballads until Motley did Home Sweet Home. So they were kind of, again, leaders of a, of a new train of thought of music in their decades, you know, and, and a, a lot of people would say in a bad way. I mean, a lot of people, what they hated about hair metal was the over-reliance on, on ballads. But, uh, I've always been somebody who loved ballads, and and I will also say that Theater of Pain. You're right. If it doesn't have Home Sweet Home, that that album's kind of a disappointment in a way. Yeah. And and Dis- Destroyer was Kiss really flexing its muscles and and going, okay, now we know what we're doing. They got Bob Ezra to to, to produce. So so Kiss was announcing its its plan to stay around for the seventies. It's tough, man, because like. 
Theater of Pain is one of the first albums I ever bought, you know what I mean, for metal. And so, I mean, I, it, I really love it because, because of yeah. that, mostly. I realize that it's not the greatest album ever, but I dig a lot of the songs. And there's some cool deep tracks, but come on, man, I'm sorry. You know, Detroit Rock City, King of the Nighttime World, God of Thunder. I mean, Do You Love Me? I could go on and on and on. There's really nothing on there that can compare. So, I mean, I, I'm going Destroyer. I don't know about you. I'm pretty sure you are, too. Right, right. And, yeah. and and I do, like, I like Motley. Like, some of those, um, shit, Tonight We Need a Lover, Raise Your Hands to Rock is kind of fun. Yep. But I, I, I really, and we've talked about this before on my channel, like, Smoking in the Boys Room. I liked it as a teenager, but the older I get, the more I'm like, oh, that song kind of sucks. So, um, but Destroyer, oh, I, I have no problem saying I worship that album and and it it almost can do no wrong so that's might be the easiest choice of the day well maybe not but it's it's close to being the easiest choice uh destroyer over over molly crew and strangely enough just let me say right now it is tied three to three so this shit is tight there you go there you go <laughs> it's no molly joke crew and tommy lee would have it no other way than being tight okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you oh, okay so uh, <laughs> alright <laughs> next up we're gonna go Love Gun versus Girls 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 this is perfect 77 versus 87 it's kind of like back to basics for both of them right because if you look at Destroyer and I know Rock and Roll Over came after Destroyer but if you look at Destroyer you know, we, we definitely, like you said, with the production, there was orchestras and pianos and all this kind of shit that was never really in Kiss music. You don't really hear that on Love Gun so much. Love Gun's definitely back to basics for Kiss. Yeah, and, and I mean, it, it seems weird to say, but a lot of people were upset with Destroyer. Right. And even, I like, I've read interviews where after Destroyer, Kiss is like, okay, we, we did something different. Now we're going to go back to our roots, and and so then you know, rock, rock and roll over was more was more back to the basics. Love Gun was definitely more bas- back to the basics, and then Motley Crue with Girls, 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 they went away from the frilly white, mm-hmm. oh you know, glam look, and and you know, and I think you and I have said this before when it comes to the their their appearance. Motley Crue were, were always kind of leaders, you know. They went yep. glam before everybody with Theater of Pain. They went, they went toughened, you know, biker and black leather on Girls, 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 and they were doing that stuff. Be- you know, they did that before um, Guns N' Roses was out with Appetite for Destruction. So back to the basics with with each of these albums. When you think of the image, man, you know, Kiss was really following Motley image-wise during this time frame. You know what I mean? Because if you look at, like you said, if you go back and you compare Asylum to and Theater of Pain, you know, Theater of Pain was first, and and, uh, yep. and Asylum followed, and they followed that image. Crazy Nights was the same kind of thing. You look at Gene Simmons, he was wearing all leather. Paul was wearing jeans a lot. So it's like they were kind of following whatever Motley was doing, at least in the 80s. You're absolutely right, and and in in this in the seventies, Kiss were kind of leaders. They were like, "Hey, we're doing what we're doing." And in the eighties, they they kind of said, "Okay, now we're we're going to just try to fit in." And Motley Crue was was definitely the band that I think they looked to first. Um, and you know, I mean, Motley Crue were were leaders throughout that entire decade. Some people said with the keyboards, they were kind of going after a Bon Jovi thing. So maybe there was a little bit of that. But, sure. but Kiss following Motley Crue in the eighties, you know, you can definitely see it with with the musical changes and with with the appearance changes. And both these albums are kind of sleazy. You know, Kiss went as sleazy as they could go for the seventies, but the, but Crue really sleazed it up on this one. This is a sleazy, a dark sleazy album. <laughs> Well, and and this, you know, when when cocaine is your is your co writer, that <laughs> you're going to get some some sleazy stuff, and you know this is and shoot, Nikki said once, you know, if we didn't have the two hits with Wild Side Girls, 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 that might have been the end of the band because everybody was addicted, everybody was struggling, and if that album had flopped, that that might have killed them. But you know, luckily, and I mean, those two hits are huge. Two of my favorite songs of the catalog. Yeah. So you know, so and and then they were smart enough to go, hey, we need to get straight uh, before they recorded the next album. So. So what do you think, man? If you had to pick between these, what are you going for? I, you know, you might. I love 
I, I really do like girls, girls, girls. And, and surprisingly, in the last couple months, I've realized I used to think, oh, they got the two big hits, but there's a lot of other solid songs on Girls, Girls, Girls that I really like. Me too. All in the name of rock. I think the co- I think the the ballad "You're All I Need" was pretty original and yep. kind of dark. I thought "Dancing on Glass" was solid. I like however, that however, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but "Love Gun" might be. Or is well for sure is in my top five Kiss albums of all time, mm-hmm. and maybe in my top three. And I stole your love, shock me tomorrow and tonight. I can't believe that wasn't a single. Mm-hmm. The the title track, almost human, and <laughs> somebody's going to get pissed. I actually like that stupid cover of "Then She Kissed Me" <laughs> for some reason. I hate that. I, remember- I should have put that on the hair model songs we hate. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I remember being in eighth grade, and and my one of my best friends had a car. He had his license like really early, and we were driving around. And the only two cassettes that we had were Kiss, Love Gun, and a John Cougar Mellencamp cassette. And I just kept, can we play the Kiss one? Play the Kiss one. So I, and I think for that reason, because it was at a you know such an early point in my life where I heard it so much, I just I've always loved it. So I, I got to go with Love Gun. I got to go Love Gun too, man. Motley Crue taking a massive blow right there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's it. I kind of saw that coming, but uh, I do. I'm with you. I, I mean, Girls, 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 another album that was early in my days of buying hair model. And uh, I, I love it, but man, yeah, I, I can't. You just can't. You can't top Love Gun. I, I think I think Love Gun is, is where Kiss really reached the top of their powers yep. in the 70s. Oh, yeah. they, they start. After that, kind of, you know, then we get to the solo albums and the movie and all that. But at Love Gun, they were all still together, and it it was the last epic album of the 70s, I think. Seventy nine versus eighty nine, Dynasty versus Feel Good. It's the final one of the decade for each of them. And here's what's interesting, because I know before we started, you kind of questioned me a little bit, like what what's the correlation? Well, yes, end of the decade, you know, the last album they do before their their drop offs in popularity. But you know what else, man? They're both dabbling in what's going on at the times with the times, because Kiss is dabbling in the disco thing. That was huge. And yep. Cruz dabbling in the hair model because even though they created it, they're they're not as dark as they were, man. This ain't shout at the devil, you know what I mean? This is right. so sticky, so sticky. This is pretty. Uh, this is yes. some of this stuff's kind of cheesy, man. They're kind of playing into like the poison that kind of scene, you know what I mean? Yes, and and you, you know, I mean, where where it's it, like we said, the correlation. Kiss started out as leaders; they kind of end up following, and Motley Crue was a leader. But once you know the Bon Jovi's and the Poisons and the Cinderellas and the and the Guns N' Roses started get, I mean, and these guys were selling five million copies of their albums or ten million. All of a sudden, Motley Crue goes, "Okay, hey, we need to add some of these elements." And you know that without you, which uh, you know I put on our yeah. list of, of songs that we hate. Um, so y- you know, yes, even though they started that genre. By the end, they, I think they were saying, hey, you know, it's, it's okay to pick a little bit from that band and pick a little bit of, uh, from this band. And it ended up working because Dr. Feelgood went six times flat. Oh, hell yeah. And, you know, a lot of people bag on Dynasty, but if, you, if you're really dissecting it, there's only two disco-y, poppy songs on there. You know what I mean? Well, actually, I wouldn't even say Sure No Something is disco-y. It's more of just like a, a you know, it's like a late 70s power ballad. But if yep. you look at, you know, I Was Made is undeniable. And Dirty Living has some disco elements. But, man, I love Dynasty. It's one of my favorite Kiss albums. I love Charisma, X-Ray Eyes, Magic Touch, Hard Times. I mean, you go through that sucker, man. That's a solid-ass album. And when you and those other songs, aside from the singles that I mentioned, they're right on par with Love Gun in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? So right. it's not that different. The only thing that, like, I, I really don't like Sure Know Something. And even though it gets a lot of shit, uh, I was made for loving you. I mean, damn, I love that song. I mean, mm-hmm. through through most of most of my life, you know, when you get older, you're kind of yeah, they were trying to do disco. 
but they did disco and they did it catchy as shit and they rocked it up in a cool way. And I will also say that 2000 Man is, geez, that's one of my favorite Kiss songs. I mm-hmm. still jam that thing. Yep. Yep. And, you know, I mean, Ace, you know, he, he didn't always get a ton of attention with the singles. I mean, they were shocked me, but 2000 Man was amazing. So, so I do like the Dynasty album. But I also, I also can, I can, when you get that album, you can sense like, ah, oh, maybe they're running out of ideas. Oh yeah, yeah. And the thing with Feel Good, I mean, I think we've we've had this conversation. I've had this with a lot of other people. Is that you know, aside from for you, you know, like without you, but the, but these singles were strong. You know, you wouldn't have had the album that you had if you didn't have these strong singles. And the right. deep, and, and they've stood the test of time, man. Apple just did some kind of thing today where they did displayed what like some new stuff that was going on with their phones or whatever. I mean, yep. I, I know I'm aging myself because I'm not articulating this very well, but <laughs> they played "Kickstart My Heart" to kick the thing off. You know what I mean? So like these songs, these songs have stood the test of time. But I think this, the non-singles have not. You know what I mean? When you listen to stuff like Slice of Your Pie, Sticky Sweet, it's okay. You got to be in the mood for it, but it's I don't to me it's nothing that's really stood the test of time. Yeah, I I, I tend to agree. Um I do think I think the song Doctor Feel Good oh, was oh. a I, the Doctor Feel Good and Kickstart My Heart were both like those were, were songs where, you know, especially Kickstart, I mean that wasn't copying anybody. They were going, "Hey, we kind of like punk. Let's let's do something, you know, punk influenced." Um, and and so, but then, yeah, on those other singles and without you, then then the, the copying was a little bit more blatant. But um, you know, I, I think this is. I think a lot of people would be surprised that this could actually be a good battle. I think most people right away would just automatically assume it's Doctor Feelgood. Mm-hmm. And I'll be honest, I think I'm going to choose Doctor Feelgood. Nice. But it, it it wasn't it wasn't the the easiest choice um, when you look at when you look at all the songs. Yeah, I gotta go Dynasty because I think it's like up there with one of my favorite Kiss albums. So I'm going Dynasty. So a little sure. difference of opinion there, but like I say, hey, we're both right. They're both good, man. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we get to Killers and Decade of Decadence and yep. eighty one ninety one. You know, we're we're doing a compilation. I think there's it's under different circumstances. I think Motley Crue like we're still kind of had a shot. Kiss were right. at like the bottom of the barrel at this point. You know what I mean? Their careers have totally tanked, and uh, they put four new songs. I, how many new songs does Decade have? I'm not exactly sure, but it's somewhere of, of the same ballpark. It's like a it's like four songs, right, that are new? Yeah. yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, three or four. Yeah, so what do you think, man? I don't really know. I'm, I'm going to have to listen to what your thoughts because I'm not exactly sure where I want to go with this one. What do you think? Okay, so, um, you, you know, you're right. Both at, both at integral, in, integral parts in the band's history. So when you get to, to, uh, to the Killers, yeah, Kiss is in turmoil. The career's not going well. They're, you know, people are leaving all that stuff. Motley Crue is still at the height of their powers when they come out with decade of decadence but we what we don't know is what's going on behind the scenes right right you know your, your management and all that can make everything look great but they've been touring had all all sorts of addiction issues so i for me i i have to judge these on on the new songs and so kiss and i, I don't have it right in front of me so what you got uh, I'm a legend tonight. What are what are the other new songs on uh, on Nowhere to Run, Partners Nowhere in to Crime, run. Down on Your Knees? Yes, and and so to me those are 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 they're actually pretty solid songs. Yeah, but when you when you get to a decade of decadence, I think Primal Scream is is where I I. I envisioned, and geez, if I'm talking too loud, let me know. I get kind of jacked up about this stuff. No, man. <laughs> I think I think Primal Scream is is where I envisioned Motley Crue going, mm-hmm. kind of that that punk hard rock uh, combination, and and I loved their their cover of Anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols. I thought it was phenomenal. So and. I know there was another one. There was a song, wasn't there? I think there was a song called Angela, Angela or something yep, like that. Yep. Um, so I honestly, I, I don't, I don't have any thoughts about that. But I think 
new song wise, I'm going to give a slight edge to Motley Crue. And, and here's another reason why I'm going to pick Decade of Decadence. Is Kiss had already put out double platinum? I mean, Kiss yeah. has been known for putting out greatest hits after greatest hits. So we had already gotten the greatest hits, you know. And yes, the the new songs helped on Killers, but I have to give the edge to uh, Decade of Decadence. I'm going to be with you, man, and go Motley Crue because I think um, Primal Scream is like worth the price of admission, right there. You know what I mean? Like that's exactly. just like so killer. And here's the problem. This is what I didn't like about the Kiss songs that are on um, Killers. I do, I do like them, but it sounds like a Paul Stanley solo thing. You know what I mean? There's it like does. zero Gene Simmons presence. There should have been a Gene Simmons song, or at least you should have felt like Gene Simmons was there. Maybe he wasn't there. Maybe he was. I have no idea. But he's, sure. his, his presence isn't felt on those songs whatsoever. And they're almost like... What's, they're like they're the bridge. They're the bridge for, like from the elder to creatures of the night, and they don't have a lot of I don't know. They're just they're just there's not they're not there yet. You know what I mean? That, I think that's the best way to put it. It's just not there yet. I think once you get to creatures, whoa, we've arrived. You know what I mean? Like yes, right. But like here, it's it, it's good, but it's just kind of generic. I guess is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, the, uh, I, I I like those songs. But they'll never make one of my favorites of Kiss playlists. No. Primal Scream and, and for that matter, Anarchy in the UK are still songs that I would go, hey man, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to those that I, you know, but the Kiss songs, they're just another couple decent songs that were on an album. All right, man, I'm wicked excited about this one because I can't wait to see where this one goes. And, and this is yeah. where we've got a difference of what happens in the band's career. So Lick It Up and Motley 94. So I'll try to explain where I'm going with this one. All right, so yep. Motley 94 is the first real studio album of a new decade for Motley Crue. Uh, it's also you know, a, a, a comeback album for, for Kiss in the new decade as well and signifies some big changes. You know, at this point... There's some real lineup changes that have happened in KISS with Eric Carr and Vinnie Vincent coming in. But the biggest change is the makeup is gone. You know, publicity yes. start 101 right here. We're taking the makeup off and we're going to see what happens. Uh, it's kind of like make or break moments for these guys. Motley's in the same kind of boat. Like the styles have changed. You think to yourself, well, well, maybe this could work because Vince Neil is kind of the poster child for 80s hair metal. We're in the grunge yep. era. You know what I mean? But I think what we're going to find out as we talk about this is that Kiss got lucky, right? Kiss kind of fell into a new decade where metal was cool, right? Motley yes. Crue is in a decade where metal is not cool. You know, young kids are going to look at Kiss and say, oh, there's this new band, Kiss, and kind of forget about that, the 70s thing, where, like, not many young kids are going to be, like, down with Motley Crue, unfortunately. This is, this is the climate that we're in for these two. The, it's, it's, it's the complete definition of irony here. here yep. Motley Crue, at the end of the 80s, is, you know, in the top couple biggest bands of the world, along with, you know, maybe Guns N' Roses, Def Leppard, you know, Bon Jovi, and... And here they go into this new new decade, and you know a new scene. And you now I love the '94 album, but it's a failure. The tour is a failure. Yeah. Everybody's like going, "Oh, here's this dinosaur band," and they're and Kiss at the end of the '70s. They're dying. Their career, you know, a lot of people are thinking it's over. You know, they can't sell out, you know, concert halls anymore. Their last couple albums barely eked out gold. And all of a sudden, here they come, and they're one of the older bands. And all of a sudden, it's, yeah. And, and I think you, you made a good point. The makeup was off. People were looking at them like a brand new band. Mm -hmm. and, and suddenly, you know, here they're going platinum. And yep. Motley Crue is eking out gold, a complete. You know, a change of 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 you know success of the level of success with these with these albums, and most people I think would have would have thought Motley was going to be able to carry on. Kiss was 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 done for, and now they've changed places. So, confession time for me. There's something about Lick It Up that I've just never liked, and I I can't put my finger on what it is. I think what it comes down to for me, and there's probably a ton of people that'll disagree with me. When Kiss does a heavy album. Gene thrives, 
Paul does yep. that, right? And I, I don't, I don't think I'm way off base here. So songs like Exciter, Give Me More, and all that, I just they don't do anything for me. Like you know, not for the innocent. Like I'm in on the eighth day. Yep. Like I think this stuff is great. And Creatures of the Night suffers from the same kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Keep me coming, and all it's okay. But man, War Machine. Come on, you know what I mean? Oh. Like Gene is in his yeah. element on these heavier albums. So I think when Paul's kind of out of his element, it, it's kind of weird. And some of that stuff of his just doesn't feel very Kiss-like to me. You know what I mean? Where right. like with Gene, it makes sense. Uh, Motley 94, I'm with you, man. I, I love that. And I'm just going to say it right now. If somebody said, you're going on a long trip for like a, a month or something, and you can only bring one of these with you, I'm, I think I'm bringing Motley 94 with me because I feel like there's there's new things always to discover on there. You know what I mean? That's yes. just, it's a, very creative. The whole John Karabi is a great new element to it. And, you know, it's Motley with a different voice, which is weird because I'm a huge, as you know, I'm a huge Vince guy. But I do like this album. And I was there for it. You know what I mean? I saw the tour. I bought it. I was drinking the Motley 94 Kool Aid when it came out. Uh, unfortunately, yep. I still wasn't really into music yet when Lick It Up happened. So I'm just putting it out there, man. I'm not. I, I will discuss my side no more. I'm going Motley '94. So I, y- y- I was. I'm actually kind of shocked. I, because I've always I love the song Lick It Up. I think it is one of the most utterly catchy songs of the '80s when it comes to '80s rock bands. I still do, do not change the channel if lick it up comes on but when i look at the rest of the album i'm I'm, and i'm and i'm trying to and you're right it's the gene outside of lick it up that the best songs are the gene songs but i'm looking at it i'm like how many of these songs would i still put on a playlist and want to listen to to today you know i love on i I do like and, and on the eighth day uh not for the innocent is good but really Lick it up would would be the number one because and here's why I said it's kind of weird. I was expecting to say lick it up, but then I look at the Motley Crue album and you know it's like a new band and I feel like people who don't like that album need to just go hey it's a new band Vince Vince Neil isn't singing because it took me a while when I first heard that thing I was like what is this I put it away. And then sometime down the road, you know, you're bored and you're like, okay, I'm going to throw that thing back in. And in a few listens, you're right. You start to go, oh, wait, what about that song? What about, oh, here's something different from Motley Crue. And I love John Karabi's voice. And and you and I have, have, have both, you know, along with there's a group of people on X, mm-hmm. you know, rest in peace, A Fish. But a, a lot of people love that album. And so I, I'm I'm going with Motley Crue. Yeah. You know, and another thing we didn't mention is that, you know, when you look at both of these, they're both dabbling in what's going on with the times. Because if you, if you listen to certain aspects of Motley 94, there's some Alice in Chainsy stuff that's seeping totally. in there. You know what I mean? And Kiss is doing the same thing. Kiss is trying to be like Scorpions and, and Maiden and stuff like this. So, so they're, they're taking cues from that. But, and then one last point I want to make before before we move on to the next one is really Motley 94 is a freaking drum album, man. The drums oh. are killer. They're so killer. Huge. 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 And and, and you're right. They, they, they were both, you know, you could argue that, that Motley 94 definitely has a lot of grunge elements. Yep. And and Kiss in, in 1983, you know, is, is taken from, you know, I don't know if it was, but the Rats and the heavy metal bands yeah. and... and and so, you know, it just, it, it worked, at least in, in the minds of the public, it worked more for Kiss than it did for Motley Crue. But I, like I said, going with Motley Crue. Motley's winning, man. Eight to Oof. six. I, who, nobody saw this one coming, but who knows? Oh, man. Maybe, maybe some, maybe, the, the, there's three left that could really change the tides here. Okay. They, that's That's true. It's head scratching time, right? These are the albums by the bands that are head scratchers. That people to this day, it's very, very controversial. You know what I mean? People, people yes. argue about these albums all the time, whether they're good or they're not. But people still don't even know if either of these are good or they're not. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to put the elder against Generation Swine, and this has nothing to do with years. I just think it has to do with like 
departure albums. Like, yeah, Motley 94 was a departure, but not as drastic as Generation Swine was. I mean, Generation Swine is all over the board. Motley thinks they're Nine Inch Nails. They think they're Marilyn Manson. They think they're Stone Temple Pilots. Maybe there's a, a little fraction of Motley Crue in there somewhere, but it's real hard to find. Elder... Kiss totally abandoned everything that they were. You know what I mean? It's it's like they're they're doing this like uh, rock opera, and it's very serious. There's no songs about girls or any of the kind of stuff that they ever sang right. about. The only real Kiss like song is probably I. You know, or maybe yes. the Oath. There's not there's not much that's Kiss like on this album, especially. And then releasing a ballad to start World Without Heroes. <sighs> this is some weird times, man. What do you what do you think? And 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 a, a a ballad by Gene Simmons, right? You know, Super like like weird. you can see a, a a Paul Stanley ballad. If you're going to re- release a Gene song, it's got to be you know your war machines, your unholies, not a, a world without heroes. Right. I just thought that was such a weird move. Yeah, but you're you're right. This is where both of these bands are like, what do you want from us? Right. That's that's what I think of when I think of Generation Swine and music from the elder. And Kiss decided that the answer was, well, Pink Floyd's one of the biggest bands, and and the critics have never liked us, and the critics love Pink Floyd. So let's do our best impersonation of Pink Floyd. Yep. Maybe the critics will love us, and, and then the fans will follow. And then Motley Crue, you get to Generation Swine, and I, just, I, I always think back to this interview that John Karabi did, because even though it's a Vince album, John Karabi was there when they started writing that thing. And Karabi is talking about, he goes, okay, we're, we're doing a song, and I'm, I'm getting ready to sing. And, and here's Nikki and Tommy. And Tommy's like, give us, you know, give us some power, like, like vulgar display of power. Yep. And, then, and then Nikki's like, okay, but make it make lush melodies, like Manic Street Preachers, who are this, this UK kind of alternative <laughs> band. And, and, and John Karabi's like, dude, I'm sitting in there going, who the fuck are these bands? You know? Yep. And and they're trying to be all things to all people. They have no clue what direction to go in. And and both of those albums just be ended up being a disappointment because they didn't just go, look, we're a hard rock band and, and we're going to do some variation of the hard rock that people know and love us for. They both went off into left field and it didn't work for either one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think for me, man, I you know the elder. I liked the elder when I was younger, and now I'm. It's weird. Now I'm to the point where I, I just don't have a lot of love for the elder. Like the the concept doesn't flow because the they put the songs in the wrong order. So you know, or whatever yep. the record label put the songs out of order. Whatever it is, it, and they don't have the spoken pieces that were supposed to be in there to make a coherent story. So. It's just yep. not true kiss. You know, both of them too, man, were swinging for the fences, right? They were trying to get a hit because they like you said, they tried to be Pink Floyd for for Kiss and and they had a a flop with Unmasked and they were trying to, you know, regain some popularity, try something different. And Motley Crue were trying to regain their popularity by bringing Vince back. And none of the stuff worked, but at the end of the day, most people on X know I'm a sucker for Generation Swine, man. I, I'm a sucker for Motley Crue, <laughs> and I'm a sucker for Generation Swine. Oddly, man, I was getting into some of the music that they were getting into as well. I was starting to dabble right. in a little bit of electronic stuff and industrial stuff. So for me, it was just like, oh, my band is just kind of being themselves, but dabbling in a little bit of the music that was going on. So I didn't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it today. And I saw them with the, for the record release party. My wife and I went, and we saw yep. that in New York City. And it was it was wicked cool, man. So good yeah. memories. I got to go Jen Swine. But, you know, the elder, I give Kiss credit, but it's just not for me. So uh, I'll, I'll go on the record as saying both of these albums are a huge disappointment. Um, but I just, I, okay, I do like the song Afraid of Generation yeah. Swine. Like when that came out, I was like, "All right, you know," and I bought, shit, I bought it right away. But that was the only song that, because even though it's kind of alternative sounding, it was it was catchy. Yeah, it was it was still like you know there were there were hints of the Motley Crue you'd heard before, but after that, that album lost me completely. And even though I do not like the Elder, um, you know, I I I do like uh, the Oath is not bad, and and. 
it's kind of interesting some of Paul's like operatic voice. I don't mm-hmm. recommend that he do that very often. <laughs> but you know, I was still a a had a had a semblance yep. of the seventies kiss that you came to know and love. Um Mr. Blackwell was was okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. So even though I, I would never claim to like the album when it if it's between the elder and generation swan, I'm going the elder. Cool man. I like it. All right, so next up we got Revenge versus New Tattoo, and basically these bands are coming into their third decades as being bands, and both of them, let's face it, back to basics. You know, they've they've tried a yes. lot of shit, they've dabbled in a lot of stuff. Kiss got their balls back for Revenge, some great stuff on there like Unholy, Heart of Chrome, and Motley Crue. Mm, is it great stuff? Okay, wait. It's a, it, you know, it's a step in the right direction. You know what I mean? I, I do yes. like a lot of that album. Uh, what do you think of these two? Well, so so I think this is both of these bands going. Hey, we got to get back to what what got us to where we were. Generation Swine was a huge disappointment, and and I I haven't listened to New Tattoo in years, and I just did a couple weeks ago, and I was actually surprised at how much I liked it. Nice. You know, I, I I had thought, you know, I gave it a chance when it first came out. And, you know, sometimes you do that. You listen to an album once, you don't give it enough of a chance, you put it away. And then years later, you're like, okay, I'll revisit it. Well, I'm a firm believer that you have to listen to an album three or four times before you know whether you like it or not. Totally. So I listened to it the other day, and I was like, shit, you know, it's a return. You know, it's not a classic 80s Motley Crue, but it's Motley Crue saying, hey, they want us to do something in that 80s vein, vein. And shit, nothing says 80s more than Hell on High Heels, their first, the first single. <laughs> the song that and, I hate. You know, the song I can't stand. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the guitar riff is definitely back in that 80s vein. And Kiss, you know, even though like Kiss had been going at least gold and oftentimes platinum for the 80s, a lot of people thought hot in the shade you know forever was co-written by michael bolton yep. and you know uh, so a lot of people were hot in the shade was full of filler kiss was trying to get back to let's just be tough they, look they featured a, a gene simmons song as the first single the utterly brilliant unholy so it's both bands trying to go back to the basics yep. trying to give the fans what they what they want and and here I'll give you my pick first because sure. I think if you follow my channel, everyone knows that I worship Revenge. It, it may be my favorite Kiss album of all time. If not, it's in the top three. So for me, it's an easy choice. Revenge by a mile. Now, one thing, a couple of things I got to say real quick before I give my response, which won't be very shocking to anybody. But anyway, <laughs> though. There are some really cool songs on New Tattoo. I like yep. Treat Me Like a Dog. I like Fake. You know, there's there's some cool stuff on there. She Needs Rock mm. and Roll. Uh, but, man, there's Revenge was a, a proud time for me, man. It was like oh. my band was back, you know. And yes. uh, so I am definitely going Revenge all the way. But uh, one weird thing that people probably don't think about. Both of their drummers died around this these albums, right? Eric Carr yes. died around Revenge. Randy Castillo died around New Tattoo. Yes. Strange, very strange, man. Very strange. That, that yeah, I didn't even think about it until you just brought it up. I mean, wow, that's that's right. Because it completely, you know, sometimes you forget about the Randy Castillo, Samantha Maloney yep. uh, phase of Motley Crue. But damn, yeah, that's that's kind of eerie when you think about that it. Is but weird, man. yeah, and and uh, uh, Re- Revenge. Uh, you know, I thought that was going to be the album that set Kiss up for the for the '90s. I'm like, Kiss can survive with grunge because most of these grunge bands loved the '70s rock. Sadly, that album only went gold, but damn, it's a banger. I wish they would have continued on that way. Now, here's the craziest thing, man. We're at nine for nine right now. Oh. This is Jeez, crazy. What's going to happen here? This is crazy. This was not planned. <laughs> Nothing has been planned. I, I nope. of, Some of them I didn't even know what I was going to pick, especially with like Killers and Decade. I had no idea. Hello. 
so here we go. That this is it, man. This is the last album that we'll pit against each other. This is the reunion albums, right? So it goes yes. circus. We get everybody back together. And same thing, uh, Tommy Lee comes back for Saints of Los Angeles. I think these are both in 8, right? 98 and 08. Yep, Another that's weird, right. weird coincidence. Uh, what do you think about these two, man? What, what, how, give some thoughts on each album. Okay, so so I'll be honest. I wasn't as as pumped for Saints of Los Angeles. I was excited for it, but I was more pumped because, you know, Kiss... I mean, such an iconic band, and and you know, even though I love both of them, I was just so excited for that reunion. I I had seen the reunion tour. I mean, the world, you know, that was the biggest tour in forever. They sold out Tiger Stadium in Detroit in like forty minutes. So I was unbelievably excited for for Psycho Circus, Saints of Los Angeles, a little less so because sure. I, I was so disappointed with Generation Swine. And um, yeah, yeah, shit. With the one we just knew, tattoo. Even though I, I it was, it, I liked it. It wasn't something that grabbed me like I like Revenge had. Now we did skip over an album by Kiss, Carnival of Souls, that was kind of a shit show. So that could have been anyway, a head scratch, it, another head scratcher right there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so you get to these albums, and and again, I feel like it. it Motley Crue was going okay. We got to come up with something sleazy and eight. They were trying to do that, you know. The the title tra- Saints of Los Angeles. There, you know, was, I I felt like it was it was what I wanted to hear from Motley Crue. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, this is Motley Crue doing what I want. It didn't quite grab me as much as I thought it would. And Psycho Circus, I felt like that was. I mean, to me, that's a complete Kiss '80s hair metal album. Mm-hmm. And they were like, you know. It, in two thousand in in ninety eight, yeah, that was yeah, that was ninety eight. It was it was like I don't know I don't know what Kiss was thinking. I wish they would have gone more in the revenge era, but they were yeah. going hey, the you know we had this great period of fun during the mid eighties. For some reason, they were like we're gonna do a, a mid eighties album, uh, and you can tell me if you disagree with that. So I was I was I don't want to give you my my well shit. It probably sounds like I already did kind of give you. My <laughs> I think opinion. I know where you're going. I thought Psycho Circus was was half filler, but I really did like four to five songs, you know. And some of them were cheesy, but I I loved the title track. I loved uh, uh, shit. Uh, what what's the the you're you're the best? Oh, you wanted, you wanted the, best? the best. You wanted the best. I thought it was a cool rock song. And and there's a couple more. Raise your glasses is kind of cheesy, but yeah. I, I enjoyed it. And and nothing on on Saints of Los Angeles, even though, like I said, it was the album that I think I wanted from them. Just nothing grabbed me. So I'm a Psycho Circus guy. You know, it was weird. Um, I got an advanced copy. I don't even ask me how, but we must have known. We knew somebody back in the day that worked at the label. We I got an advanced copy of this on a somebody mm-hmm. sent me a bootleg cassette of it. And I just remember hearing Psycho Circus and thinking, this is amazing, all right? Yo, Then you totally. get to Within, and eh, this is pretty cool. And you get to uh, Pledge Allegiance to the State of Rock and Roll. This is good. Into yep. the Void, right? Okay, so we're, we're, we're crushing it, right? After that, though, man, I think it's over for me. Like, I don't like any of it. Like, I don't like that stupid uh, We Are One, right? Oh, that's horrible. Like, you that's mentioned, horrible. you. I think You Wanted the Best and Raise Your Glasses are the most for, forced corniest songs that I've ever heard. <laughs> you wanted the best. Like, it's just like, what? Yep. And then the Raise Your Glasses sounds like a commercial for, like, Wheaties or something. You know what I mean? Like, totally. it's just so bad. And the totally. nothing keep, can, well, no, I don't even know. Whatever the ballad was, you know, was weak. And then the thing that sucked about the Gene songs is you go, like, that journey of a thousand years. It's like, dude, Gene's got to have some balls. Like, where's the balls? Yes. Like, that's what makes a good Kiss album, even a classic yes. 70s Kiss album. Where's the Gene with balls? You know what I mean? So, yes. bad choices. And what's funny is he put some of that shit on his solo album. Like, he put Sweet oh. Dirty Love. That's a great song. That's way better than some of the songs that he's got on Psycho Circus. Right. And that was supposed to be on Psycho Circus. So, Bruce Fairburn didn't make good decisions with the songs. So, no. And then when you think about all the hype and then all that Kiss did was the same old bullshit that they did on Dynasty and on Mass where they didn't even have the guys playing on the thing. You know what I mean? Yep. So I think in retrospect, 
Like, I don't like this album. I think it's contrived. There's like three yep. or four good songs. It's very contrived. It's very deceitful with what they did. If they would have just, even if, I don't even care if Peter's performance wasn't up to snuff, I think it still would have been better than just putting a, a, sca, you know, a scab studio guy in there, or Kevin Valentine, or whoever the hell yep. plays the drums on that. Um, so, no, it, I'm not saying that Saints of Los Angeles is perfect. I think that song yep. is great. It harkens back to yep. Wild Side. And I kind of dig where they're going. Like you said, they got the vibe there, like down at the whiskey and chicks equals yep. trouble and, and white trash circus or yep. whatever. Else. Like I kind of, lo- I kind of like some of that stuff. Over time, it, it grew on me. So if I like, if, if somebody said you're going out, you're going on a road trip right now. What are you going to bring? You're going to bring Psycho or you're going to bring Saints? I'm going to bring Saints, man. I just, I just think there's more to discover there, and I just feel like I got burned. On the uh, you know, but then again, a lot of people say that Mick Mars didn't play on Saints of Los Angeles, so right. maybe the same shit's going on. But um, that has not been confirmed. But the Kiss thing is definite, so I'm gonna go with Saints. So because Psycho just pisses me off, it could have been so much better. <laughs> it should have been like Love Gun, you know what I mean, or Destroy. Yes, and they they tried to do something like that, but they're just so they're still way way out of touch you know on, on what the public oh, yeah. wanted well and and you can tell like like everything like you said everything was contrived within is gene's attempt to do god of thunder and right. rock and roll yeah um i finally found my way is peter's attempt at beth ah, exactly you know that's I aces that. into the void is another space song i mean <laughs> yes. yeah so that's so, that's what i hate about it. at least motley is like they're dabbling in, in like some modern rock, but then oh, you know what's a great song? Just another psycho on that album. If, if nobody remembers that song, go listen to Just Another Psycho. Animal in Me. There's some good shit on there. I'm going with that one all the way. It's yeah. I I just like I said, I I, I bought that CD right away, and 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 you know what? I probably haven't given it enough of a shot. I probably listened to it once or twice, mm-hmm. and it, was, it just seemed like a disappointment. Whereas. Even though, like, I completely agree with Psycho being contrived and just, okay, here's, we're going to do this because this might work. Um, like I said, I found four to five songs that, that I was like, you know, hey. And Psycho Circus, that title track, still, like, I think, you know, Kiss, that's, yep. that's like the epic concert opener. Good I tune. pledge allegiance to the state of rock and roll, Into the Void. You wanted the best, even though you don't like it. I, I kind of like how they're talking you about their the history. Best. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know what and I hate the, about that? This is tri- this is trivial, but Gene is the only person that sings. It sounds like on the chorus, like he he sounds yes. like he's doing both voices. And I'm like, here yep. you got this song where all the guys are singing verses. Why why aren't they all singing on the chorus? It's just Gene. I just I don't know. It's just certain things about it just irk me. So, well, I'm sure I'm sure Gene wrote wrote it and was yeah. like, okay, oh, yeah. I'm going to give you a little part, you yep. a little part. Yep. This is my song, totally. Well, but I I'm do, Psycho man, Circus. Yep. In, in a case of a tiebreaker, the only way to settle this now. Is to go member versus member. Okay, we're gonna see. Okay. We're gonna see who we like, and we're just gonna go with the original members at this point. So we're we're at ten to ten. Ten to right? ten. Like, I'm freaking okay. shocked. I did not see this coming. Okay, um, I, I have a feeling that this is gonna be a landslide with when it goes member versus member, but maybe not, man. I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. So let's just do it right out of the gate. Paul Stanley versus Vince Neil. What do you think? Who who, who are you going for? I. Man, I I I, ne- I love Motley Crue and and I really le- love their '80s output, but I, I've never been shy about saying that that I always felt like Vince was a weak spot. No, his voice is original. You know his voice. Oh yeah. So he was such a huge part of the sound, but I I just again I I. I never thought, hey, you know what's a strength of Motley Crue? is Vince Neil's <laughs> vocals. So I, I got to go with Paul. Yeah. Yeah, you got you to go there. And um, the other thing that, you know, I, I'm with you. Now, you know I'm big into Vince Neil. I always say Vince Neil's my favorite guy. Vince Neil makes Motley Crue for me. But the guy never really wrote much music for Motley Crue. You know what I mean? He's not. He doesn't have the creative no. powers that Paul Stanley has. Well, you it, want to say, like, in their heyday, you know, you want to put, like, Vince's peak, like, Dr. Feelgood against Paul's peak. Paul's is always going to beat him as a better singer. He's a better singer. He's a better songwriter. He's a better producer. It's no contest. <laughs> Paul Stanley, all the way. Absolutely. And, and I would even go, you know, uh, 
the better front man, even though I think Paul's stage raps, like sometimes now I look at him as kind of embarrassing. Yeah. But when you look at those old 70s concerts and you look at who's going to command a crowd, Paul versus Vince Neil, Paul had those audiences, yep. and, you know, eaten out of his hand. And Vince was a good front man, but Paul was on a different level. All right. Gene versus Nikki. Okay, I'm going to let you start this one. Well, Gene Simmons is my favorite guy in Kiss, so yeah. this this is going only one way for me. The, the yeah. other thing, Nikki Six, a great talent. I mean, he's probably written more hits than Gene Simmons has. You know what right. I mean? So, like, as a songwriter, he's probably written more hits. He ain't the greatest bass player. He's gotten better over the years. But, man, when Gene Simmons was, was just coming out in the early 70s, his bass lines are slick, man. Those totally. walking bass lines. And he sings. And he does it yes. live. I was just watching something. Somebody, I think it was Dave Kinney posted it on, on, um, on, on X. It's, it's them doing going blind, you know, and like during the kiss my ass era or whatever. Yep. And Gene's just all over the fretboard and he's singing it. So, and let's not discredit some of the great songs Gene has written. I mean, I love it loud, rock and roll night, stuff like that. And, and, uh, and you burn bitch burn. Burn bitch burn. And you wanted the best. I mean, that's a great one. And he's, yeah. the, I mean, come on, dude. When it comes to the characters of Kiss, he's the freaking coolest oh. character. The, the breathing fire, the spitting the blood, the makeup yeah. that he, of his. It's Gene Simmons all the way. No contest. You you, you said it all. You know, the, the guy, and, and Nikki was a great songwriter, but Gene wrote songs. He sang songs. He was demonic on stage, especially during the makeup years and then the revenge years. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's man, he's been the, not on stage, but he's been like the mouthpiece for Kiss, like yeah. off stage. I mean, the yep. guy has such a, a presence. And he's not afraid to be a dick, right. which, you know, sometimes sometimes endears, you know, he's like not about kissing everybody's ass. And sometimes, you know, I, there's I've had periods of my life where Nikki's kind of disappointed me like, oh, we're not hair metal. We're, not, we're don't associate us with the 80s. And I know they started hair metal, but, y you know, the, the, the way they kind of shit on the genre, you know, yeah. and cropped on a lot of those bands. I was not a fan of that. So. I'm, I'm with you. Easy choice, Gene Simmons. And look at um, look at Nikki around like Shout at the Devil, where he's doing all those photo shoots with blood all over. I mean, it's a total Gene ripoff. So oh, totally. Yeah, exactly. This one's gonna be these next two are gonna be a little bit tougher. Though. I don't think these are gonna be it's clean sweeps or be easy. Ace Freely yeah. versus Mick Mars, man. Take start it off. Start us off. <sighs> Ugh. I've I've never been shy about saying like I love Mick Mars and and. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, like some epic freaking guitar riffs in the in the history of Motley Crue. I mean, some of my favorite songs of Motley Crue, Live Wire, um, Kickstart My Heart, and Wild Side Girls, Girls, Girls are strictly because of those riffs that he came up with. And so I, I've always been like, man, my, Mick is is my guy in Motley Crue, but Ace Freely. I mean, shit. When you're a kid growing up, Ace Frehley is a superhero, yep. and 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 so I don't play guitar, so I wouldn't. Y y you would be the one to know who is the more talented guitar player. I really don't know, but because of you know, I'm man. Kiss Kiss is my band. I oh, it, shit. Back in the day, I I I always said that Ace was my favorite member. That changes nowadays, um, but I gotta go Ace. Yeah, I mean, dude, Ace is my favorite guitar player, hands yeah. down. I, I love it. And if you wanted to ask me who is the most proficient player, okay, Mick Mars is probably more a proficient player. But Ace right. is so damn creative, man. Go back, you know, just listen to something like the guitar solo for Dr. Love. You know what I mean? It isn't super crazy, but it fits just perfect. It's it, you know, it's it's like a song within a song type of a thing. Yep. You know what I mean? And it's the same thing like the, the, the Shock Me solo. I, you go through any one of his solos, and let's face it, man, he's he's a he's a cool singer. He ain't a great singer, but he's a cool oh, singer. Oh, totally. And he's a great songwriter. He was even writing songs on the first couple albums, but other people were singing them. So so I think yeah, there's no content. I, I love Mick Mars. Mick Mars. Mick Mars is one of the strong players in the music of Motley Crue, like you said, yep. but Ace is, come on, man, like you said, just the character and everything that surrounds it, it it's, it's Ace all the way. And shit, when, when you got to the Kiss solo albums, it's easy for me to say that, that Ace is, is the best Kiss solo album. 
Oh yeah. You know, sure. Gene's was horrible. Paul Peters was shit. Paul's was pretty good. But Ace Man, he just surprised. Rip it out, New York Groove. I mean, I know New York Groove is a cover, but Rip It Out is maybe my favorite song on that album. Yeah. That's an amazing song. So, And he's had a solid solo career, you know, sometimes uneven with how he releases albums, and sometimes, you know, sometimes up and down. But I'm an ace guy. You got to go, yes. Okay. Peter versus Tommy. Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tommy. Yeah, I don't, yeah, no, no, sad. Now, here's the thing. So we'll, we'll elaborate a little bit here. So Peter okay. Chris was pretty, pretty solid in his day. People forget, you know what I mean? Yep. I think they look back to like how he played on the reunion tour, which wasn't horrible, but it just wasn't, it wasn't like 1975 Peter Chris. He was pretty solid. He, he was creative. Yeah. He did some cool shit, but he really declined, you know, as you got to like yeah. the, the later part of the 70s. And then when he came back, he just wasn't the same player. Tommy Lee is somebody who's always been pretty solid on the drums and, and really yeah. has tried to keep up with like what's going on with in music. Whether you agree with that or not, I think some of that has helped him, you know, kind of stay current and, and develop as a drummer. And like I said, when, when you listen to the drums on that 94 album, you know what I mean? Or Dr. Feelgood, oh. for that matter. There ain't yeah. not Peter Chris ain't got nothing. I mean, that stuff, no. would, that stuff would shatter Peter Chris's ribs. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's just, yes. it's brutal shit, and it's really cool. And, uh, yeah, I got to go Tommy Lee all the way. Uh, yeah, so so I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll say, like, I, I had a period where I really was, was not liking Tommy Lee, you know, and yeah. I mean, his solo albums were always like, okay, what's the new in thing? Oh, it's going to be rap. I'm going to have a rap solo album. It's yeah. rap rock. I'm going to do that. Then he had a solo album where he almost kind of sounded like, like, like a Nickelback. <laughs> I can't remember which one it was, but it was very like a uh, pop rock in that Nickelback vein. And, and again, he's another one who kind of, you know, shit on, on the era and in Peter's defense, he had Beth. He was singing songs. I mean, shoot, some of my favorite Kiss mm-hmm. songs have Peter on. Have you know Peter singing shit on the debut? What's uh, nothing, to, nothing lose. to lose? I love that yep. song. And, yep. and I think Peter has such a great rock and roll voice. He does. I don't feel like they took it. And then when he went solo, he never. You know, I'm like, do a powerhouse rock album with your yep. epic scream. You know, like he had a really cool rock voice, but he never really did that. But when you look at the, the the albums from the high points of each of these bands, Kiss in the 70s, Motley in the 80s, um, and I'm not a drummer, but most everybody knows that when you were looking at the best drummers, Tommy Lee was going to be in the discussion. Now, what if we had said Eric Carr, Eric Singer? might have been, the, you know, eh, it, it might still have went the same way, but it would have been a lot harder. It, 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 would have, it would have been. I think, man, Eric Carr in the 80s was a beast. Yep, so. yep definitely. But, but when you, you know, and... Yeah, I, I don't know, but when you go Peter Chris, uh, I'm going Tommy. Well, shocking, man. This was shocking that we we went with those albums that we picked that we were ten for ten. That was pretty. I was surprised at that. Uh, it looks like the strength of the Kiss members pushed it to sixteen versus twelve, but uh, and I think that's probably the way it is is meant to be. So we have just proven that the masters are the masters and the students yes. are the students. The students didn't become the master, but. Uh, Man, this was fun, man. I, I, I really, I've been cooking this up for a long time. I really thought that the, there was a lot of cool correlations and different things to discuss, man. This was a blast. Oh, the, oh, this was so fun, and and, and I'm not like now, like as we were doing this, I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I'm like, what other bands could we do? Like, oh, let's do one on my channel. So yeah, we yeah it was it was great. Here, I wanted to ask you this. Yeah, who did you think was going to win just the album battle? I mean, were were you like, oh? You know, the Guru is a huge Kiss fan. It's going to be Kiss because I know Kiss is like your favorite band. Or how did you think the album was going to work out? Um, I, I thought it was either going to be really tight or Kiss was going to take it. One of the, you know what I mean? So I ended up, I was yeah. kind of surprised that it was a tie because I didn't know where you were going to go with a lot of them. I, a couple yep. of them, I wasn't even 100% sure. So right. uh, I kind of just figured it out. But, you know, for me, I don't know about you, but I'm just going to say, I mean, Kiss is my number one and Crew is my number yeah. two. That's my, my favorite, two favorite bands shake out. Is that the same for you or is, it, is there somebody no. else up there? I, I mean, I've always known, I mean, I love Motley Crew. I, I don't, you know, they would be in my top ten. Mm-hmm. But I don't, you know, I've I've always, you know, Kiss is I've way been way more into Kiss than Motley Crue, so I was I was, and I I knew that Kiss was, you know, your favorite band. I was kind of 
I was shocked that it was tied. I was like, oh, Kiss will be up four or five before, yeah. you know, by the time we get to the end. So for it to be a tie. And I was, you know, surprised that I picked the amount of Motley Crue albums because it wasn't until I looked at it, you know, I, I really the Lick It Up and what album did went against Lick It Up 94? Yeah, Motley 94. Like I, like I had expected to pick Lick It Up, but do some research. And you're like, no, like, like you said, uh, Desert Island, I'm taking yeah. the Motley Crue album. So. And, so, uh, yeah, no, that was a blast, man. And, and here's the last point, man. Both retired and both came back. <laughs> yeah. Both, both of them desperate for money at any cost and not afraid to admit it. So we know now we're just waiting for Motley's Farewell Tour. That should be coming. Yeah. So based yeah. on our calculations, that should be in 2033. So That's that's right. That's right. Hopefully, hopefully Vince can make it that long. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, hey, man, I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. This was this was a lot of fun. Hey, it was a blast. Uh, let's 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 get more stuff like this going. I think I think people are going to like it, and and you know we were having fun, so I think people who, who check it out are going to have fun too. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on, man. All right, brother. We'll be talking soon. All right, buddy. Have a good one. <laughs>